Words are about to be spoken here on the Extreme Life of Matt Hardy, presented to you by Podcast Heat and the Ad Free Shows Network, and this week, Wrestling According to Alba.com. I am the host of the Extreme Life of Matt Hardy, John Alba, and that is the broken one, the woken one, the spoken one himself, Mr. Matt Hardy. What's going on, my friend? Oh, you know, just hanging out here, Wrestling According to Alba. I think we're doing a... Uh doing a uh, a stream if i'm not mistaken correct so i want to say what's up to all the uh, all the members of uh wrestling according to alba the alba knights alba's army i don't know what are we rolling with here do you i, I, I don't know you tell me you're they, the, they like you're going the by alba's army i don't know how i feel about the whole you know me and militarization of things i don't know how i feel about that but um i i'm super grateful to uh have you here we are live if you're a member of wrestling according to alba.com it is my wrestling patreon that I got to do a ton of fun stuff every single week. We do tape studies, match breakdowns, Q and A's, a great discord. It's super fun. And they have access to this particular episode live. So if you're watching live, feel free to drop a comment or a question for Matt, but I'm uh, Matt, what a fun time it was this weekend in Atlantic city. We wrapped up nineties wrestling con with a live episode of the extreme life of Matt Hardy talking the attitude era followed by a brother nero concert first time we've done one of these dual events i had a great time how about you uh, i enjoyed it. it 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 was fun uh i i really enjoyed the the live extreme life of matt hardy podcast that we did some really fun stories always great recounting those times uh especially when we first started and it was the wild wild west days there's so many great entertaining stories during that time this is an episode you need to go out of your way to try and hear if you get the opportunity to hear it soon down the road as we put it on the uh, the feed of the extreme life of matt hardy or podcast and i'm sure we will but anyway uh i, I just want to say one of my favorite things of the whole weekend is that we finished up and we left and they're like oh, i don't know people are getting a little antsy i was like i don't know john you want to go back out and do a little comedy until brother Nero and his uh, guitar guy gets here. It's, it's so funny because we had like the time timed out pretty well about when we were going to go. And like, we hit our time perfectly. Uh, not saying we're professionals, but we're pretty half-assed <laughs> professionals and we hit our time perfectly. And then they were supposed to be back at that time and they weren't there yet. So it was about 20, 25 minutes before they, they were getting there. So we actually went out and we did a live, Ask Matt just kind of on the fly, which ended Bonus. up working, and and we 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 bought enough time to uh to get Brother Nero and to get a cotton top back, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, when he came back, he ran and used the bathroom and he left his phone and he had to sprint back, <laughs> and then I think his guitar player started playing No More Words, No More Words, and if I'm not mistaken, you juked with him when he got back to the stage. I right? did. So what ended up happening was, uh, you know, we we killed time. We gave him a little bonus material, which hey, you got. You got three shows for the price of one with that uh, if, if you're out there. And, uh, you know, Jeff comes in, they're loading in, they're sound checking, and Jerry, his guitarist, is sound checking. And Jeff is like, I'll be right back. Erratic behavior, you know? And yes. he runs off and he disappears. I guess he left his phone in a bathroom, like yeah. on the bottom floor or something like that. So he had to find that. So it's just Jerry and I, because I was going to introduce Jeff and, you know, get the crowd going. And we're just, chilling there jerry's just playing riffs i'm like man we gotta we gotta find a way to get this crowd engaged here so i start asking the crowd like what's your guys favorite like hardy theme song like like do you like the og do you like matt's do you like jeff's and someone's like no more words so i was like jerry can you can you give us a little no more words and he just starts playing it and now the corner of my eye is where the stage performer me comes i see brother nero running up and so i just as i see him I'm like, okay, this is gonna, we're going to intro him right here, and we're going to get right into it. And I'm just like, ladies and gentlemen, you've been waiting hours for it. He's the charismatic enigma, Brother Nero, Mr. Jeff Hardy, and he comes on. He daps me up. I start juking. He starts juking. And this wasn't planned at all, because if you looked at their set list, No More Words was not on there. But he keeps playing. I look at Jerry. I go, keep playing. And Jeff just launches into no more words. And the crowd was going nuts for it, man. It was so cool. Anything can happen in the extreme life of the Hardy boys. And, bridging uh, br bridging Jeff Hardy to his uh, time of uh, starting any kind of performance. Welcome to the last 47 years of my life, John. <laughs> it's a perfect segue, man. And it, but it was great. And no more words was a badass opener. I was like, dude, we got to do this so. every single time. We do a Very show like so. this. It was yeah. so cool. No more. They they really nailed two awesome 
solo songs for you guys. They, they yours did. is so great. Live for the moment. Yeah. No more words is great for him. I mean, were you guys both happy with those? We were. I, I I almost feel like Jeff was a little unsure when he first heard "No More Words," but he absolutely fell in love with it. I know. I know as time went on, and I, I know when I first got the Monster Magnum music, it wasn't. I had something in my mind, and and this is on me. I had something in my mind that I kind of saw me coming out with as I turned hill and did the Sensei of Attitude, Matt Hardy version one and whatnot, which was something pretty far from the the loaded song that the Hardy Boys used, obviously, but. The first couple of times I was like, oh, I don't know, maybe it'll grow on me. And it did. And it like five, six weeks later, I loved it. And I couldn't imagine doing Matt Hardy version one with anything else except live for the moment. I really yeah. couldn't imagine that. You like no more words? I do. Yeah. No more words is is fantastic. I mean, it's such a catchy, it's just, a, it's a great tune all the way around. And it's perfect for, for him. It fits perfect for him because he is a guy that, I feel like doesn't need words necessarily. There's times where just what his crazy stunts and uh, this, this crazy high spot he's going to do in the match. A lot of the things he does and the way he sells like no words are needed. So there, there doesn't have to be any more words. It almost kind of sounds like him singing too in, in the original track. So it makes sense that he covers it. It was awesome, man. Rajiv saying V one nine. He said, hope we can get a live extreme life in North California, Northern California sometime. You know, yeah, maybe the uh, yeah. Bay Area or something like that. Yeah, maybe, uh, yeah, maybe, Bay maybe Area. the Extreme Life live at the Cow Palace, Matt. Maybe so. Uh, Sacramento's up there. I'm a big, mm -hmm. big fan of Sacramento as well. Sac Sacramento, San Francisco, San Jose, oh, yeah. a lot of beautiful places through there. Certainly, Fresno. So. Dave Stockton saying, is back up north a little bit. Dave, say I'm going to need video of this Alba Juke. Thanks for having us. Of course, I don't know if there's <laughs> video of it, but it was, it was, it was fun. It, it I can't say that it looked great, but I don't know. Who's to say? Um, but it, it, I mean, you can't say if it looked great, but did it feel great? Did you? Oh, I dude, it? I was I was riding high in the moment. I was like, I'm juking with Jeff Hardy. We're on stage doing concert. We just did an awesome podcast, and the podcast was great. It was a fantastic yeah. podcast. Yeah. Really so, happy with it. So just and there were some stories that I hadn't even heard from you because I've heard pretty much all your stories at this point, but there were some that I had never heard that you told, and uh, including with the topic of our conversation on this episode of the extreme life, which is going to be Bubba Ray Dudley, bully Ray, which we're going to be discussing him. And I'm very excited. So we'll have to see what other stories you've got there in the bank. Where you've saying, come on over to Sacramento. We'd love to have you. Hey, tell someone to book the extreme life and uh, brother Nero in Sacramento and we will make it happen. We love it. We are not above it. And you had a killer signing the next day too, right? Yeah. Oh my God. We were at uh, Pandora's box and uh, anyone who is listening to this when it drops on Friday that, that was out at Pandora box. Thank you for coming out. And we were so happy to be there. The last time we were there, which was over two years ago, it was in um, May or April, maybe even April of 2022. Uh, we, had X amount of people that they'd kind of said, we'll, we'll do and we'll cut off ticket sales, but they sold like 300 extra tickets. I mean, and we came there and we signed for about seven hours and we had to leave because we had another signing and an actual show where we were wrestling that night against Matt Cardona and Brian Myers. Um, so, so we had to leave and we left like oh, 200 people, 200, 250 wow. people there. And there was almost a riot. It was crazy. There was almost a riot because we left and they'd been waiting there for so, so long. Uh, and we did all that we could do. I mean, we went overtime as it was anyway. So we went overtime this signing, but we still had plenty of time to our flight went and everybody got through. We had got to have time with everyone. We got to give everyone a moment. We got to interact with them and feel like we got to talk to them on a personal basis, which I love. But yeah, we went through everything. It was a very long, a mentally taxing and, uh, and tough day, but we got through it and it was, it, it felt, Felt very good at the end because we went through and we completed that signing at Pandora's box. Yeah, we were trying to get you to the finish line over in Atlantic City, but Brother Nero is just so gracious with his time with everyone <laughs> that we had to be like, come on, let's go. Yeah, let's get out yeah, of yeah, here. yeah. <laughs> Definitely had to pull him out. Just, just going to say, John, as, as we're sitting on here talking too, man, uh, I just saw uh, I had to turn on my NXT stuff right there. The Rascals kicked off NXT, and uh, lo and behold, halfway through the match, Joe Hendry, walks down and he's actually doing commentary, kicking it off right there from the jump. So very excited about the TNA NXT uh, agreement that's going on right now, how people are crossing borders. Very, very interesting. You do believe in Joe Hendry. You've made that very, very clear. I do. I'm a, I'm a big advocate for Joe Hendry. I would not be surprised if we see even more of Joe Hendry on other WWE shows in the not-so-distant future. 
I would I would almost bet on it. I would almost yeah. bet on it. Mm. Well, we're going to be seeing you on a show that I think a lot of people didn't expect, and that's GCW. Tell us all about this SummerSlam weekend, Matt Hardy. Yeah, um, an opportunity came up. Uh, I, I've been reached out. Well, well, it's funny. You know, I will go ahead and, and go ahead and put this out there. So the promoter from GCW actually reached out to me the day before I was going to debut at Rebellion when I, I came out and, uh, and Twisted Faded Moose after his match against uh, Nick Nemeth. So he said, hey, you interested in coming to L.A. tomorrow? And uh, th- there's a couple guys that had talked to me about doing some stuff there, and there had been some interest. And I'd spoke to, to Brett, uh, Brett Lauderdale a couple times. And um, I said, no, I said, I- I'm booked already tomorrow. You know, and that's kind of what I left the conversation at. Obviously, that was on the, the, the big kayfabe. Um, I said, no, I'm booked tomorrow. And he said, well, I'll be in touch if some other stuff comes up. And then a um, couple ideas started happening. And then uh, they were churning. And, and this is more than just one appearance for me in, in GCW. So we're going to do a, a, a multi-show deal. And uh, it's going to be exciting. Uh, I, I think it's really exciting that they announced it, that Matt Hardy's going to be there. And I think once you find out who I'm wrestling, people are going to go even more nuts. Uh, and then it's going to lead to some other stuff. And I think it's going to be really cool. I'm very much looking forward to it. And surprisingly, I was pretty pumped about how positive the feedback was. And it seems, uh, seems like it's going to be a win-win so far. I'm going to spare my creative pitch for this publicly because I'm very keeping my fingers crossed that it comes to fruition. I've told you about it. And sure. uh, I spoke to someone in GCW about it today as we taped this. And they said, oh, my God. That's got to happen. So fingers crossed that, that that gets across the finish line. And if it does, I'll tell everyone, because <laughs> I think that is pure Internet galore that is waiting, should it. But you will be a great fit in GCW. And when you were telling me that you were going to leave AEW, I said to you immediately, media, I was like, man, a short little run in GCW would be yeah. awesome for you because yeah. they're, they're very open minded, Matt, about what wrestling can be, you know? Yeah, no, it, it is. It's cool. And, and it really does have so much buzz and it's got the cool factor right now, right? It's like where all the cool kids go. And what about that asshole, uh, Matt Cardona? Do you happen to see what he uh, he put after they announced I was going to be in GCW? He said, I can't believe you, Matt Hardy. Uh, you're going to come here and try and leech off of GCW. Yeah. He said, you know, just trying to do this and, and gain more notoriety for yourself. I'm going to do my best to cancel this appearance. He's well, just hot. I didn't go through him to get booked there. Well, it's because he's jealous because like you're the real Mr. Sports Entertainment. And like, that's his thing. Now he tries to be Mr. Sports entertainment. So you're impeding on what he perceives to be his territory, even though if I'm not mistaken, he came into our territory first on this podcast. So not really sure what Cardona's standing ground on, you know, you're, you're not wrong. I can't tell you that you are not wrong. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's interesting though. It's uh Matt, Matt Cardona is an interesting guy and the way he has built such a, name for himself as any god and a lot of that has been through gcw it's going to be really interesting even to see if we interact following this uh you know when he got online and called me out like very like good the point from he, he, he says cardona is an edgehead not team extreme well i mean you got a point there uh to me you are nothing more than edges bitch i think joe hendry said it best i mean that's mm-hmm. they played that actually when they were in the dome of deletion that's true hey real quick offshoot comment from dave who was at our live show in Philly said, happy belated to the Gothic baby. Want to thank you for your thoughtful answer to his question at the Philly live show regarding his upcoming baby girl who will be here in September. Of course, man. Once again, congratulations, man. So happy for you. It's uh, being a girl dad is, uh, is great. It's I'm so lucky and I am so blessed that I have got to be a boy dad and a girl dad because I wanted to experience both. Absolutely. Uh, The TNA, documentary they put on social media this week man that was pretty cool yeah 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 and and whenever you're watching this it will be out already it dropped wednesday at noon uh it's called immersed and it's a it's it's a behind the scenes it's a behind the scenes documentary a look at myself and moose over the course of the day before we went to war at against all odds And, and and it's really good it's done very well it's it's done in a way where it is not insulting but it also really lets you look into the mindsets of the people, the people, uh, Moose, the person, and Matt Hardy, the person. It lets you look into their mindsets and kind of see what they want to accomplish and where they're at in their career and what their goals are. And I think it, it was really well done, and uh, it, it, it was a lot of fun. And I'm so cool that happened 
on the night where my wife returned and then my brother returned as well. So all, all of that really made it out to be a, a, a huge grand slam. And if you're watching this on Friday or Thursday night, you've seen the return of the Hardys in yes. TNA where they have teamed together. And unfortunately you saw things did not end too well for brother Nero. However, Matt and, and your wife, Queen Rebecca, but we did have uh, the extreme life of Matt Hardy cameras were there on site rolling throughout the day to get some behind the scenes footage of the Hardy's epic reunion in TNA. And you can look out for that on our socials over the course of the next week or so as well. So I'm excited for people to see yeah. some of that. We'll probably be dropping some really cool videos to YouTube and we'll just be putting stuff on socials. There's going to be uh, uh, a myriad of backstage footage from that TNA event and you're going to get to see a lot of it. And uh, it's very, very cool. And I'm, I'm very excited about Slammiversary which is coming up now when you're listening to this. Uh, it's either Thursday night or Friday if you're hearing it before, but I will be at Slammiversary and I will be in a singles match and uh, and I definitely have to get some revenge on uh, a certain somebody because of uh, what went down on Impact on Thursday. Yeah, we can talk about it now too. I mean, that crowd in Philly was unbelievable, wasn't it? That, yeah, they were great. I mean, we were late in the night. We were third or fourth from last match and just the – the love and the enthusiasm and the passion and just the intensity that they gave us. It was unreal. It was, uh, you know, it was the, the classic Hardy boys pop. You know, we, we used to get that once in a while back in the day when we first started getting over and, you know, 2000 ish, 2001, they said, Oh my God, there it is. The Hardy boys pop, you know, cause a lot of it would be like real high pitched female voices too, but it is, it's just like this excitement and this enthusiasm that like, people don't always get because it just, it's like where you have these two human beings that they really kind of give a shit about. And that's so cool. And the, the, the epitome of a Hardy boys pop obviously is a uh, WrestleMania 33. And there's been a couple other pretty notable ones, but I think this, this weekend on, on TNA, when you watch, uh, when, when you go back and watch impact, uh, when you go back and watch impact, if you haven't watched it yet, you will see that it was a, a really special connection between myself and Jeff oh, yeah. and the people in that venue. Fans at the 2300 arena, ECW arena were ready for that Hardy boy entrance. And it was awesome. And we're going to be talking about an ECW figure on this podcast in Bubba Ray Dudley before uh, we get into that. And before we get to, you know what I'm going to tee you up on. I do want to mm -hmm. ask you on the WWE front real quick, Matt. Yes. man, we've both been really so invested in the Wyatt six trajectory and how they've been handling that. And they did a twofold segment on raw this week where we saw Bo Dallas referred to as Bo Dallas for the first time and uh, things got physical where uh, Chad Gable and the Creed brothers who are now aligned with him beat up Bo Dallas and he kind of enjoyed getting beaten up by them and the rest of the Wyatt Six came out and we also saw a taped interview with Rowan which is kind of what you and I were pitching a few weeks ago here on this podcast with Uncle Howdy interviewing the other members of the Wyatt Six. I have thoughts on this. I'd love to hear what yours were first though. Yeah, I, I think it was also uh, very smart from a booking strategy that the uh, that the Rowan interview is what went first, and I think you it was it was emotional. It got you invested, and you're seeing the pain of these real people and and why they are motivated to do what they do and become the Wyatt Six and become a family. And his, I, I knew his case was going to be a tearjerker right from the jump, you know. Brody, one of his best friends, Br Bray, one of his other best friends, and, you know, both gone, which is just unfathomable. If you think about that, two of the closest people that you lean on the most in life that you talk to every single day that are your your brothers and those people to, to be gone from your life. So he he, he really you, you could tell as he was speaking that it really did. It, it, it strikes a very emotional and, and, and sad chord in him about how much pain and how much hurt there is from losing those two. And, and I think tapping into that just, just makes that character seem so much more authentic and it gives him such a great reason to eat his spinach or hulk up and become the monster that he becomes with the white six. And it's really hard to figure out what side of the equation these characters fit on, right? Like clearly a very baby face promo there where he's speaking about loss and heartbreak and you just feel for the guy. But we also know that they're kind of sadistic and violent. You don't really know where on the fence they are. Yeah. I mean, that 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 is interesting. I mean, I, I think 
it has been executed so well. The effects of when that music hits, the lights shut down, the cinema that goes along with it is incredible. You see the smoke on the floors and the streaming lights. And then there, there's the big, poor, my, my son, Barty, Barty was up with me early doing cardio, Barty and, and ever. And he said, is that the portal? He said, is that like the portal to, to heavens? Is that, is that what that is? And I mean, it, it does. It looks that way, like this epic just hole that these people were walking through. It reminds me of, you know, how Doctor Strange would make the holes in Avengers and walk through it. It was cool like that, but blue, right? So the fact that, you know, they come out of this and they're walking slowly. They have these crazy hoods and masks and weapons and there's smoke on the floor. I mean, it, it transforms into like a horror movie, which is so cool. And I, th I think people are going to love that so much. I, I think initially they'll be looked at as baby faces, especially when you get sympathy on these killers, the way they're getting sympathy on these guys who look like killing machines. Yeah, I'm a little cautious about Bo getting physical so quickly and the way in which it happened, like he kind of just laughed off getting hurt. And I worry about how that translates to a wrestling match, but I don't think we're going to see them in the ring for a little bit still. So yeah. I guess we'll have to let it play out, Matt Hardy. And I'll, I'll tell you what, I liked the fact that he was laughing like that at the pain, because I feel like we're doing a, a deep dive into who, Bo Dallas is as a person now, like he lost his world. He lost his brother. Like, and, and sometimes they say that when you have nothing left to lose, what, what is there? And I almost feel like that's kind of where he is from a mental position. Like he has sure. nothing else. You're going to beat me up. What are you going to do? Kill me? You know, I've lost my brother. I lost my hero. I lost the guy I wanted to be like, what well, you can't hurt me any more than that hurt me. From and a feel character perspective, I don't have an issue with it. Mm -hmm. I worry about when the bell rings how does that translate? If you get what I mean, I'm saying, yes, I, I I do get that, and and I I, th I think the 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 best thing they can do with these people is what I suggested they do with myself and Bray, and make us more of novelty acts. You only wrestle occasionally, and one of the things that I do think is cool that they're really defining both of these personalities. And I've talked about this on the show, John. You know when I talked about when they were trying to give me pitches to stay and resign in WWE before I left and went to AEW. One of the things that was on the table is like I was working with Randy and they were talking about doing something where they put myself and Jeff with Bray where he could Bray's like the fun character at this point. He's doing the Firefly Fun House. And then you have Fiend, who is the killer. They said, we'd like to do that with you and Jeff. I think Broken Matt could be in the Firefly Fun House. It's your fun character. But then we want to have a killer character. And I'm not going to lie. When I heard this, I was like, oh, I would I'd be down for doing that. Kind of tempted. Yes, but that wasn't Vince's. That wasn't Vince's thing. It was very tempting, and Vince had already made it clear that he was ready to transition me into just being a producer at that point. So that's why I said, "Well, let me go somewhere else where I can still wrestle because that is what I want to do now. That that makes me happy." And um, and and with Jeff, they said it could be Willow, and Jeff was obviously like, "Well, that that'd be super cool too." So Jeff could be Willow, and then we have like this serious dark character where there's a dark Matt Hardy character. There's the Fiend. And then there's a dark Jeff character. And, and that, that would have been appealing. And I feel like they're kind of doing that right now with the Wyatt Six, which is which is super cool. And I dig it because you have these people that have like this human level of hurt and pain. And they, they, they bereave the loss of Bray Wyatt. They're the Wyatt Six, right? And, and, and they bereave that so bad. And their life is not complete without it. And you understand what all these people are going through. So to say, and, and it's great that they started with the two guys who have lost the most, which is obviously Rowan and, and Bo Dallas. Um, but now, now that you have these guys that are like this, and then they flip gears and they hulk up or they eat their spinach as Popeye would, whatever, and they become these monsters. It's going to be a real interesting dichotomy. And I think the most important thing about the monsters is that they don't overdo them with the way they use them in wrestling matches because they're not characters that necessarily need to be in wrestling matches every single week or all the time. It needs to be, they need to pick and choose very carefully. They need to be novelty characters that are mainly appear from remote locations. Although they have been doing a great job at making the arena look like a remote location with all the great special effects and smoke and lights and, and music and stuff they've been doing. Rajiv has a question. He says, how long is too long for the Wyatt six to build this story with all the vignettes? I mean, I, I feel like they, they've probably done the majority of the building. They 
are going to do as far as from a standpoint of the people who were legitimately the closest to Wyndham. You know, you've got other people that he may have known, but it like they weren't publicly on the record close friends, you know, with uh with with the other guys, the other members that are in the group. So I feel like they'll do a little character diving into the other guys that weren't as close with Bray and kind of explain why they're there, whatever hardship they went through to come join the white six and, and to be a family and make a family. I, I think you kind of explain all that. Uh, and, and then you move into something where these guys have to get in the ring. And I would suggest whatever they do in the ring the first time is like a weird match. Uh, maybe like something in, in the dark, a stranger things type match in the upside down world or whatever. And they murder someone, you know what I mean? They, they, they win strong and it's not like a big deal. I just, I don't, I don't really see this group being a group that's going to go out and like have a competitive 20 minute match. It's going to be a five-star match or a bangers you know, they, they call it or whatever. I, th that's not what they do. They, they are cinematic characters. They go out and tell stories and they, they, their goal is to take the human part of these monsters and make people feel sympathy for them. And then the monsters go out and then they get the revenge or whatever. Can, can that coexist with a product that is telling the same stories as Gunther versus Damian priest or Ilya Dragunov versus Sami Zayn? I, I, I think so. I think you can. I, I just think you have to be very smart about it. Um, and, and I think, once again, I think offering the different parts of wrestling, I think it makes wrestling like a, re, a variety show. And I think that brings a bigger audience in. I think there's people that are going to tune in for that great wrestling. You know, there's people that are going to tune in for, you know, they're focused on the athleticism and they want to see uh, a, a match that blows them away. Those people are definitely diehard fans, and AEW I feel like caters to them and just and just mainly them. They tell some stories, but like this thing, like the White Six, is so different and so out of the box, and it is so like movie like, and it feels epic. I think there is there is money to be made, and there are fans to be gained from following through with this this White Six thing. I would agree with that. I'm cautiously optimistic, as I said from the start. I'm cautiously optimistic just because. We saw all the promise with Bray, and we know that went through 20 different iterations because they built him to a point where the supernaturalism took over the idea that he was still a pro wrestler. And it really doomed him in the end to the point where he had to be reinvented five different times. And I just, I have those concerns, even though I, I trust the creative process more currently, Matt. Yes. I still have mm -hmm. concerns about that. And I, and I think that's warranted. It can be, but I, I think the biggest difference about this, I think you got, I think you have Vince who was, was outdated. I think with his mindset of where professional wrestling is Vince, the greatest promoter of all time. Uh, the, the he'll, he'll go down as the most legendary promoter and, and he built wrestling into uh, a mainstream uh, super product that allows all these other off spins uh, to start up. Vince will get credit for all that. Vince will go down as the man when it's all said and done. You know, that's not talking about him personally as a promoter. And then Hunter is just a different breed where he's younger. He he's, he's more modern. He's more in touch. He's more on the pulse of today's society and even the way movies are produced and, and content is produced and whatnot. And I feel so much more comfortable about the Wyatt six and their role going forward, because I know Hunter is the guy calling the shots and, and not Vince. I want to get this comment from Dave here. It says, Matt, I completely agree with what you said regarding the group. I'm curious, how do you feel about Gable's work with the Wyatt so far? It's it's gonna be it's it's interesting. I, I think it's I think it's been good in some ways because he's just he's in such a good position. I think he's a strong character. I think they can stick a couple people with with Gable and there can be something where they can go out and, and even Gable's group could be who he kills, and that like kind of creates more tension and people snap or whatever. And then, cause I think we eventually want to move Gable off to do his own thing right on his own. Uh, so, so, so I could see potentially it coming, even coming out of all that, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, pairing him with the creeds, that kind of feels like, uh, the new team angle to me. So we'll see. And you're our team angle got over huge back in the ruthless aggression era. What so. story storyline wise, where is he at now with Otis and Maxine? So and he's pretty much group. split from them and, in this episode of raw, the creeds finally, after like a month and a half of teasing joined him by his side. Gotcha. So 
that's where he's at right now. I mean, he's a great talent. He's a great talent. I know you're a big Gable guy, and so am I, and uh, we'll see what comes from him uh, as he has to fend off the Wyatts here, as you're saying. There's definitely room for cinematic in wrestling. I think the best wrestling shows, to Matt's point, have a little of something for everyone. Yeah, I agree with it. As long as it's clear that this is cinematic versus this is your wrestling, then I think it can work well. Yeah, I mean, I, once again, I, I think uh, wrestling is something that we control. We are controlling, you know, what the people see. So I, I think at the end of the day, if uh, you know you're seeing controlled results and whether it's a cinematic thing or an in-ring wrestling match, if you can understand and digest it, that we're telling stories with these specific characters. Because even like for me, I mean, that's probably where my love for this comes in right now you know that's one thing i love more than anything else and you know i've been a big advocate about how i say that i think that is where people make money and that is where acts get over when people get emotionally connected to someone's journey or their process or just their character or you know whatever makes them unique or different and and it's not necessarily if they win every match or you know what their win loss record is or you know even how great their matches are it's about what they do and what they overcome and their story, their journey, their character art. And like, there's people that will relate to those people. And I still think that is the the most crucial uh, and most paramount thing in pro wrestling. Dave asking, is the Y program something you'd love to be a part of as a performer? Or would you enjoy helping in a producer right away or even both? I mean, b- b- both of those things I think would be very intriguing. I, I mean, I, I think it's been super creative what they've done thus far with the way they've introduced it. It's very different from anything WWE's ever done, which gives me a lot of a lot of hope in, in how they're doing it. And it's been unique. It's been done sparingly. I don't think they have like overdone anything. And the way it has evolved ahead a little bit that you saw Bo Dallas in Adam Pierce's office and oh, well, he's here in his human form, so to say, as opposed to being in his Hulk form as, as Uncle Howdy. And, and I think they've done a good job at building it that way. And, you know, hopefully that continues. Certainly so. All right. We've spent a lot of time on this. We got to talk about our boy Bubba Ray, Bully Ray here in just a second. But before we can, you know what I got to ask? Please, Matt Hardy, hit us with that mad fact. Matt, Matt is finding pleasure in biking again. That's a little activity you and Max will do, huh? Yeah. And it's really, it's been fun. You know, like if I was just doing that on my own, it's just kind of boring and you have to go a long ways out and then get back. But it's, it's really fun doing it with him. It's a great bonding experience. And one thing that I do think is important that we've talked about this myself and my wife have as well. It's important that all of the children get individual time with their parents too. It's, it's important to do stuff together and make sure you, they understand that we're family and like we have each other's back and we take care of each other and we protect each other. But it's also nice to give each kid some individual time. And there's like individual things that I do with each of the kids and kind of like, uh, you know, dedicate that time to them. And I think that's important. And that's probably the thing Maxwell and I do the most right now. That's awesome. Love hearing that. It's cool that he's at the age where he can do that with you too. Yeah. And now you guys have that little bond. I'm sure brother Nero was a wild one back on the bike in, <laughs> in the day. Of course he was, he was a maniac on the, uh, you know, just a bicycle and then also a motorcycle, you know, whatever it may be. He was just jumping. Well, off, if he wasn't a maniac on the motorcycle, available. who's to say that broken Matt Hardy ever even comes to exist. That is true. So Summer nights are on my radio, Matt Hardy. I've been binging old school Sammy Hagar, Van Halen, because I am going to see Sammy Hagar perform Van Halen songs in New Jersey at the end of this month. And I picked up my tickets with game time. It was one of the easiest processes that I've ever had with my ticket buying experience because game time makes getting tickets for concerts and events faster and easier. Even if you don't buy tickets right away, prices on the game time app actually go down the closer you get to the start of the show with killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat and their lowest price guarantee. Game time takes the guesswork out of buying concert tickets. Matt, you've got a very busy schedule you're not always able to plan out if you can actually go to a concert or go to an event, can you? No, it is uh, it is tough to sometimes. And I know now my next uh, seven or eight weekends are booked. But I tell you, whenever uh, I do find a good concert and it's on a weekday and I am free, if I am getting tickets for it, game time is where I start. 
That's because they got their last minute deals where you can save up to 60% off buying last minute for sports, concerts, comedy, theater, etc. And you save even more with their exclusive in-app deals on select seats ahead of the game or the event or the concert, whatever it may be. With their zone deals, you save even more than that when you choose a section and you let game time choose the actual seats itself. And you know they're very transparent because you toggle in, you toggle on rather that all in pricing feature and it's going to show you the entire total up front. And Matt Hardy, we love transparency here at the Extreme Life of Matt Hardy, don't we? We absolutely do. And, and they are. They're the most transparent people you could possibly get your tickets from. Game time, it is one and done. They let you know everything in advance. Uh, and, and they're very upfront. They're very transparent. And we do love that here. And they got the lowest price guarantee or game time. We'll credit you 110% of the difference. So take the guesswork out of buying concert tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account and use code Hardy for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code H-A-R-D-Y for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guarantee. That is true. That's no not my business. <laughs> anyway. Let's talk about Bubba because we just celebrated Bubba's birthday on July 14th. Mark LaMonaco turning 53 years old. Another one of your brethren who just happens to be much, much, much older than you, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he is one half of the iconic WWE Hall of Famers, the Dudley Boys, Team 3D, whatever you want to call them. And he also carved out a pretty nice run as a singles guy. As well, he trains under Johnny Rods back in 1990, debuts in 1991 under the name Mongo Vile with a gimmick of a biker built from Hell's Kitchen, inspired by Max Payne, the Road Warriors, you know, those types. And eventually, he gets a tryout in ECW in September of 1995, where Paul Heyman eventually redubs him as Bubba Ray Dudley. Lot to get into on that front, but when do you first remember Bubba coming across your radar? Being on ECW, we were very loyal WWE. Why? Sorry, uh, we were loyal WWE watchers, obviously, but we were also very loyal ECW watchers. As long as we got it, we had MSG on our uh, satellite system, which was which was wild, and we would have to stay up very late to watch it pretty often. And the first thing I really remember seeing about Bubba was when he was doing the bit where he would stutter. And then they would like slap the shit out of him and he would say the word, you know, and I thought that was very like fun. three stooges. Yeah. Pretty fun. Pretty entertaining. And then he would also break, break it out and dance. You know, they'd say like, Oh, look at the big guy there. He's got some rhythm. So that, that those were my first impressions of Bubba Ray Dudley, the stuttering bit. And then him, him being a, a uns an unsuspectingly good dancer. He is integrated into the Dudley family alongside Devon Dudley 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 dances with Dudley, Chubby Dudley, Big Dick Dudley, Sign Guy Dudley, and of course, Joel Gertner. Did you have a favorite Dudley, Matt Hardy? Spike? Um, <laughs> Spike, no. of course, yes. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, I. I would say Bubba and Devon, obviously just from working with them over all the years when that, when they were, when they were doing that deal, I, I thought, I thought Bubba was really entertaining with the, uh, with, with the whole bit, with the stuttering bit and then getting hit or whatever. And he just, did, he did it so well too. It was so, so funny, so entertaining. And then I also thought it was, was great when they, a little bit later after some of the Dudleys weren't around, not the whole full big family of Dudleys, when they were doing those things and they would go out and they would like, their goal was to set a riot in whatever arena they were in. They were trying to get so much heat and uh, you know, they, they were, they were great at it and they were very, very entertaining in doing such. It was a unique presentation for sure. And two guys in Devon and Bubba who certainly did not shy away from heat. You have wrestled these guys pretty much as I, I would venture to guess they are probably the tag team you have had the most matches with in your career i haven't counted but i would venture to guess because your edge and christian really didn't have a long run but the dudleys had a much longer run as a team and you've crossed paths with them throughout the years individually too what makes the dynamic of the dudley boys work i think i think the dudley boys were good especially when they had to change their act a little bit and they went from being hardcore, right? So they were hardcore. Bubba would go out. He would get this heat. 
Devon was the guy that would say, testify, my brother. And they, you know, they would do the things about, you know, you see this big black man, he's going to have your girl. If you don't do this and you don't do that, whatever, you know, Bubba would do those type of promos. It was a lot more explicit, you know, it was definitely a, for a much more mature audience. But when they came to, when they came to WWF, WWE, and they changed their characters and they became much more entertainment driven characters in in so many ways especially once they started doing the things with the tables and once they got their whole shtick down where you know um they would do the the shove uh you know devon what devon get the tables i mean th their shtick of doing that and the what's ah uh, like i remember when that crazy commercial was on and they 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 did that and it's crazy that that got over so much it really really was over and people did like it the the fact that they did so many sports entertainment -y, uh, bits they got so over i mean it was just it made things easy with them like that i mean you would go out and when they get to eat on you they would like beat your ass you know it'd still be very very physical but there were times where we could go out there and we could work a very smart match and and entertain people and tell stories and they had so much stuff that was over when bubble was doing the stuff where he was power bombing someone through a table and and like doing the trance that stuff was also great because jeff and i we didn't do that stuff as much as they did then because our whole deal was just you know, you know, uh, we were uh, adrenaline junkies. We, we were guys who were suicidal. We were just willing to jump off anything, take any risk. You know, fear is only a four-letter word. But they really, really owned in on coming up with those entertainment spots, and, and it, it greatly paid off for them. But let's dive more into this on the molecular level. Jeff is the stuntman. You're the architect. What is the dynamic of Bubba and Devon? Oh, uh but Bubba, Bubba is the architect and, uh, and, and Devon, Devon is the guy that is there and he would contribute ideas, but like Bubba was definitely the architect of the group and that, that never changed. Whenever we would have a match, uh, anytime we were working with those guys, uh, myself and Bubba, we would meet and we would talk and we'd figure out what we're doing. And then we would just fill in Devon and Jeff and we just kind of accepted and embraced those roles. Uh, they, 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 they worked well together because i think they did have good chemistry and there was oftentimes they were good friends but they were together for so long there were times like they were a married couple where they would fight like crazy i mean like jeff and i have never fought like that we've had differences or not been as close or whatever but like we've never had like the fights or disagreements that those guys had and i feel like you know they're 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 both they're, they're both wired pretty differently i feel like bubba is very smart bubba is definitely like a new yorker you know where he's like gonna look out for himself he's going to protect himself which that's probably a good quality to have in the pro wrestling business uh especially back in 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 that day and age you know and devon was a lot more friendly he was a lot more giving you know and i think that's why devon was probably fine with kind of letting bubba be the architect and call the shots and whatnot but those two guys they they gelled and and they did have good chemistry and there were times where they got along absolutely great you know you you hear these stories once in a while in the business about how you know bub and devon like on and off on and off on and off whatever but they, they they're, they're fine they get along good they have great respect for each other you know they're both doing their own things but just back then they were young hungry guys much like we were much like uh an adam copeland and, and uh, a jay rizzo was and they were just very driven to make it and build a name for themselves and unfortunately they were end up they ended up getting to the wwf wwb and then they uh fell into the whole vortex of the tlc stuff that we all created together so they come over and i'll ask rajiv's question here they come in from ecw what's the general feeling amongst the tag teams was anyone concerned about them losing their spot because man when they come in you guys and edge and christian you've carved out a nice little niche for yourselves we yes we have and I, 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 we weren't, we weren't worried about losing any spots then. Like we, we felt really good about what we were doing. I was excited for them to come in just because I knew they were a great tag team. They were established. They were multiple time ECW tag team champs. And I very much look forward to working with them. Uh, so yeah, I, I was excited about it. I think the other teams, I remember whenever they first came in, the acolytes said, "Oh well, we can't wait to get our hands on those guys," you know, because it not, not, that's not even Ron. <laughs> I know Ron so well. Ron didn't even say that he didn't care at the end of the day. But you know, Bradshaw, just like let's test these guys and see how they react to coming from ECW to WWE. And also, I think there was a little bit of people were a little suspicious of them because Public Enemy, when they came 
following WCW, their, their stuff didn't pan out that great. Following ECW, WCW, I'm not sure if they were WCW before WWE or after. But when Public Enemy came in, people thought there was going to be these high hopes and they were going to be great, and they didn't end up working too well with the current tag team locker room. But I feel like maybe it's just perception on my end, but both of them, especially Bully, have a pretty tough background. Like they're they're not guys you can just ah oh, let's see how they do let's let's push them a little bit like I feel like they've got some bite to them. Yeah, I mean I remember they came in. They were both very respectful. They were very happy to be there. They both wanted to make a name for themselves. Um, you know, and it's funny. There's a story that goes around, and I know I told this because I actually buzzed. Uh, buzzed Bubba a little bit earlier, and it's so funny. Like I'd never call him Mark; it's always Bubba or Bully, whatever it may be, just depending on kind of what atmosphere we're in. But typically, I'll probably always call him Bubba till I'm dead. <laughs> and just uh, I buzzed him earlier today, and uh, he said, "Yeah, I think we've told all the stories, whatever." And there's that one story where there was someone who I knew that was at ECW, and myself and Jeff, Michael Hayes, had us do a version of like a 3D, and they came back and said, "Hey, I just want you to know, uh, Bubba said if you ever do that again, he's gonna like kick your ass." You know, so don't ever do that movie again. He's gonna beat your ass, which is so funny. And we saw them, and they couldn't have been sweeter or nicer whenever we saw them. And like, well, I don't think we've ever even had like a, a deep conversation about that, about how legitimate that was or or whatnot. But Devon, Devon's a sweetheart. Uh, he, he's a he's a, a little sweet kitten. Uh, but Bubba, Bubba definitely is much more of the what you would almost call like a typical New Yorker who's just like tough and hard and like. If uh, he won't take shit, you know what I mean? Like he, he will like call you out if he sees something he thinks is in the wrong. So, I mean, that I, I think that does identify with him. What do you think Vince saw in them and made them appealing about coming over? I mean, I, I just think he, you know, because it's, I don't, I don't know all the details, you know, but we were helping ECW there at some of those times about, you know, financially and trying to keep them afloat. Now, it almost, is it almost a little reminiscent of kind of like what NXT is doing with TNA now, you know, in, in some, some capacities, because we had some guys that we sent down there and, you know, some guys showed up and they did like an invasion angle or whatever. I just think he saw that they were uh, an act that had really gotten over. They were very committed to being heels. And I know Vince was big on that. Like, I'm sure he would watch that where they're going out and they're trying to create riots and like, he would go, go nuts about it because that's like what he wants. He wants somebody that's going to be a heel to be a heel and not, be worried about being cool, you know, or being popular on the internet, which wasn't even really a thing then anyway, but he did, he, he, he had a lot of admiration for their ability to attempt to be heels and they, they relinquish their fear of being assholes. Right. Um, so I, I think that that was something he liked. He saw money in that. And I feel like he thought they would be a great add to the tag team division, which they obviously were. Everyone knows about the tit, the, Try the tag team ladder match between you guys and Edge and Christian. But we covered it on a very early episode of this podcast, January 2000, the Royal Rumble yeah. pay-per-view as the first ever tag team tables match. And I'll tell you what, Matt, if the ladder match hadn't happened a few months prior, I think we'd be talking about this tables match as being the one that was the real groundbreaker for the Hardys. They come into Madison Square Garden and tear the house down with you guys. If you want to listen to our episode on it, it's like episode three or four yeah. in the archive. Go back, extremehardy.com. But adding tables into the conversation and having a match like that at Madison Square Garden at a big four pay-per-view, what did that performance do for all of you guys? And what did you learn about the Dudleys in that match? Uh, I learned that they were... A defiant we were both kind of defiant in that moment because we had uh several minutes cut off right before we went out there and we, we were just like fuck it we're gonna burn through this match and still do all our stuff like if we don't sell as much as oh well so be it like we've put together a lot of good stuff and these things are difficult and they cut our time at the last moment so we're gonna burn through everything and get it done and i think that's almost one of the one of the uh really attractive things about the, that match in, in in some ways because it's just utter chaos all the way through and there's so many table breaks during the course of that match which is so wild and just people keep moving 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 it was bomb after bomb after bomb after bomb but once you you were saying if the ladder match didn't happen that the table match is what we've been talking about but if the tag team ladder match didn't happen at no mercy the table match would not have happened i remember being talked about what could we do with the dudleys and i said dude these guys like did tables 
you know, ECW, that's what they were famous for. I said, what if we had, we created a table match as opposed to them just putting us through a table. Really? So you the know, table match was your pitch. I, 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 I told them about it too. I mean, it, it, I, I know it was an idea that I thought of that would parallel with what we did with the ladder match. And I knew they would thrive obviously in that environment. And, and once again, I know I talked about that with Bubba and with Devon and they were down for doing it. And once again, not saying it's my idea, but that is something that we were circulating. And I thought if we could mirror kind of what we did with the tag team ladder match with edge and Christian, that we would have something special. Take a little, uh, take a little credit for that, man. That's pretty cool. I didn't know that that might've come from the mind of Matt Hardy a little <laughs> bit. So that's uh that's awesome because I mean, you guys go and you put on an extremely memorable match in Madison Square Garden, and it takes this whole trio rivalry to a whole new level. How do you feel adding tables to the dynamic change things for the three teams? I mean, it, it, it ended up being great because we had already been tied to ladders since winning the you know original tag team ladder match. And then those guys had been tied to tables for years because of their stuff in ECW, which was, you know, very famous, very iconic already at that time because they did so many crazy table things, right? Um, so we were very happy to do it and and add them to 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 the ladders. Uh, well, what took a little while to just figure out was just the chairs, you know, because like Adam and Jay didn't really have anything, you know. We had to figure out some sort of weapon, you know, that they could have that would be able to counter the uh you know the tables and the in the ladder so yeah i was super happy to have uh tables involved because like i knew that would give us a lot more that would give us a a much wider creative slate to create these unique bumps especially with ladders you can fall off ladders through the tables there can be tables outside of the ring you can take crazy bumps outside of the ring go through a table so yeah we were we were all in and i mean that was especially in those days in 99 into 2000 2001 i mean especially Jeff and I speaking for us, we felt invincible. So we were super happy to do those matches. That was our forte. You were putting us in our greatest environment where you'd let us get out there and just cook as the kids say, you know, regardless if they get mad at me or not, we would just go out there and we'd cook. Cause we'd have all these ladders. We'd have these tables and we'd have these chairs where we can come up with all these, you know, interesting ways to use these inanimate objects. So, as we go into the TLC matches, the triangle ladder match, TLC one, TLC two, TLC three, where does Bubba stand in the pecking order of helping put these matches together? He, he, he always came packed with ideas. He was always full of ideas, very creative, had good ideas. Um, I feel like a lot of times Adam and Jay always both contributed to what was going on. I feel like most people would have said then that Adam was probably the guy who called the majority of stuff, but it was, it was Adam and Jay and, and they both have brilliant minds. I don't think that's any secret. I'm not like a divulging any new information there, but then like when it came to the Dudleys and the Hardys, it was always Matt. A lot of times it was like Matt, Bubba, uh, Christian and edge, you know, and we were kind of like putting together stuff. Devon would always be around. He would always be there. He'd be interactive. Jeff would just usually say like, well, I was just thinking like if I was trying to go for the belts and someone moved the ladders and I'm hanging and then like, is there like a way like edge could like jump off something super high and like spare me? Can you guys get that in? All right. I'll talk to you later. I'm going to go play music or whatever. You know, that, that was like his mentality. You know, we'll figure out that one big Jeff spot is going to be the big shine. And I mean, that, that, that worked. Can you think of one spot from any of the major tables, ladders, and chairs matches, including triangle ladder, that came from Bubba's mind? I think the super table did whenever we did WrestleMania 2000 uh, because we were trying to figure out a way. We're talking about doing a super table on top of the ladder. Like we set two ladders up, and then the Dudleys pull out this unique table, and they set it up where you can stand on the table to get the titles. And then I remember we ended up building these braces around. So it would like sit flush on top of, of the ladders. And if I'm not mistaken, I think the super, the super table on top of the ladders was probably there. I do. Interesting. Okay. And TLC two, when you and him go through the four tables, is that something coming from both of you? Yeah. Well, no, it, it was his idea originally to go through the tables when he did that in TLC one, one. 
TLC that, one. He does that. That was, his, that was his. And I do remember because like we were not going to have that many tables, and I, I think he went through four then, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And and we were like, we we're like, well, do you think you can do it in two? Because like we might need some other tables to do this. He said, No, I'm gonna need four. I'm gonna need four. I'm definitely gonna need four to do it. And uh we just once again we just kind of like one upped it. Uh and we had two. Why guys why is that tables. that you need four for a spot like that? Uh four just makes it look more destructive. Four is safer. I was just it's, gonna ask, it, is it actually safer because you're giving yourself more surface area? Well, no, it's not the service area. I mean, you had to hit it the same way. You just it, because the first two tables break your fall, and the second two tables break your fall even more. So, like there, there, there is, it, there can be repercussions from that. Like you could have a, a, a part of the table break and like stab in you or whatever. But like typically, if you're looking to do something safe, like if you have two tables or you had four like that, and you're falling from high on top of the ladder out of the ring, I mean, it just cushions your fall a lot more if you're falling from so so high. So you could do it through two tables, but it would be more of an impactful bump after you got through those those that first level of tables as opposed to having two level tables. I'd love to know who wrote the book on that and explained how to go through four tables because I feel like I'm talking to one of the people that wrote yeah. that book. No, for sure, for sure. <laughs> we were we were we were definitely defining that territory day by day. Yeah, you were the crash test dummy. Yeah. For that sort of thing. That's crazy it is really crazy to think that that stuff came from you guys and uh, we know that you just built such an amazing legacy out of those four tlc matches including the triangle ladder and things get a little interesting after that matt you know all, all three teams kind of peak at that juncture and the 2002 brand split comes around you and jeff eventually move towards a split usv1 Jeff stays right. on Raw. But I remember as a kid, one of the most gut-wrenching was seeing the Dudleys split up in that draft. Because I don't think anyone really wants to see the Dudleys split up. Right. And Bubba just kind of keeps his character. Devon becomes Reverend Devon, which would lead to the debut of Deacon Batista, of all people. Yeah. But splitting the Dudleys up, it just kind of didn't work and it only lasted a few months. Why do you think it didn't work back in the day? I mean, especially with those guys, it was so hard because they were just not beloved as this unit, right? Just when you have a tag team that is beloved like that so much, it's hard like to split them up and for them to get over once again on their own. And I, th I think that was tough. And like, you know, Devon's deal of, of being, you know, <laughs> being a reverend was, something I, I guess it was something he was going to try and pull off and i'm sure it just stimulated because he said, oh my brother testify i'm sure that's exactly where vince got the idea to do it um i i don't know the backstory on that for the record too i'm not saying i was kind of into true. reverend devon i won't lie to you that was yeah. a fun gimmick <laughs> um but it, it it was great to see them get opportunities on their own to to do their own thing and uh I don't know it's just for me as a wrestling fan if i was watching and i'd followed the the dudley's from ECW into WWF, I would want to see the Dudley stay together and just keep kicking people's ass. I mean, I, think I, 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 this, I'm going to say this too. I, I don't think there's a point where if you had Hawk and Animal, you know, uh, after their awesome stuff in the territories and after they did NWA and kicked ass and they came to WWE into that, like if you split them and like had them doing different gimmicks outside of the, the road wars, I don't think people would, would buy into that either because they're so beloved together as a tag team. People love them for being the askers they are. And I kind of feel like the Dudleys fell into that category a little bit. Do you think Vince saw Bubba as a potential singles top guy? I think he saw Bubba as a smart guy that he probably had hopes that he might could get there. Um, you know, he, he, he probably wasn't the body type that Vince was necessarily into. But I, I think he saw a lot of potential because Bubba is a very savvy business guy and conducted his business in a very smart way. Interesting, because he never gets that opportunity in WWE, even the second time around, which I'll get to in a minute. But uh, th they eventually leave WWE. They go over to TNA. They have a really good run in TNA. I think some of Team 3D stuff in TNA is really underrated. They captured the IWGP Tag Team Championships. And eventually, Matt, 2010, 2011, Bubba has a little bit of a character shift where he becomes Bully Ray. 
Right. And on the surface level, you hear the name Bully Ray and you're like, man, that's kind of a stupid name. But they kind of lean into the bit a little bit. You gotta. It's a little over the top. He's obnoxious New Yorker. And he starts to get over with this bully character. And it feels you said like he's, he's a little over the top and an obnoxious New Yorker. Have you listened to him on Busted Open? <laughs> <laughs> well, it feels like he's starting to lean into a little reality is what I'm saying. Right. And he's starting to be a little more himself. We'll get into what he'd become as Bully Ray. But upon making the transition into this new character, Matt, why do you think he started to find success with it? I, I think it was I think it was good for him because he had a unique vision of what how he could highlight his strings, how he could play to his strings. And I, I think his strong personality, especially as a just how he is as a negotiator, as he is as someone who is working with someone in lockstep trying to put together a match. I mean, he's very smart and very protective of his of himself and his business, which is a quality, which is great to have if you have that. There's some guys that are just too nice or too generous. Jeff and I probably both fall under that. But I, I think he was allowed to like really take the reins when it came to the bully character, and he felt like, hey, I could really push this in the right direction where people will buy it as legitimate and authentic, and I think that's kind of what happened with the bully Ray thing. I was just about to say... You watched him at the time, and you kind of believe that this guy's an asshole. Right. And that makes him successful to the point where he becomes TNA world champion. I'm not sure a lot of people, a lot of wrestling fans at the time, with all due respect to Mark, I don't think a lot of people at the time saw him as a potential world champion. But then he gets the keys to the kingdom. And even though TNA was kind of going through a roller coaster period at the time, he holds his own as a top guy and as a main eventer. What do you think of his main event run as Bully Ray? I enjoyed it. Uh, I really did. I was very happy for him. I, I thought it was uh, was cool and good. And I know he worked with Jeff some in that. And Jeff enjoyed working with him, you know, because they had that bond of obviously all of us working together back in the day. So, so I thought it was good, man. I thought he did a really good job at like, he didn't change a ton of stuff, but he did reinvent himself and he evolved himself into, you know, going from Bubba Ray Dudley to Bully Ray Dudley. Well, it was really character driven stuff. You know, it's not yeah. like his ring work was changing all that much. Yeah. I mean, it was similar. It was the same stuff, you know, uh, you know, but he just repackaged himself and he kind of repackaged how he did things in, in many ways. And I just, I thought he, I think he's a smart, I think he's a smart business guy and I think he's really a savvy savvy performer knows how to protect himself and, and look strong out there. What is he smartest about protecting his stuff? Like, uh, for instance, like, like the 3d. I, oh my God. Yeah. The 3d. I mean, there was one point where we were in one of the, I don't know if it's a triple threat. It may have been the triple threat ladder match. And he said, well, like if, if you're taking that 3d, then it needs to be seven or eight minutes before you get up and do anything else. Like you need to be selling it that long. I mean, he was very adamant about taking care of the 3d and you know like some people would bitch and complain about that but you know looking back in hindsight i mean it's it's a smart thing to do because i mean guys like taker they would definitely protect their finishes you know guys who uh were, were top guys would protect all their finishes where there's a lot of other guys that are just uh, a little too giving you know jeff and i we do things with the twist where someone would kick out or whatever but you know they were very protective with their finish and they optimize them always well, it kind of leads to the 3D becoming one of the most iconic tag team finishes ever. I mean, you see a guy get Irish whipped and all of a sudden the crowd starts going 3D and you've yeah. got this whole different situation as opposed to some of the other teams that can't get a move over like that. I mean, it just seems like he was someone who had a very unique personality, especially in those early days when you're on the road. I mean, you guys were on the road together a lot. Any good road stories you can share with us about Bubba or the Dudleys in general? Yeah, it's funny. I was going to just uh, buzz Bubba on this one, and he, he said he didn't even remember, it, which is so funny. Um, we were in Montreal, and if I'm not mistaken, there was a flight that was canceled, and we had to go to, to New York City or Newark, somewhere along those lines. And we ended up renting a car, and I was able to get a big SUV 
or maybe Devon even got it because he was driving. Uh, there's a big SUV, so it was the Hardys and Dudleys. And we never typically like travel together. You know, we 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 traveled quite a bit with uh with Adam and Jay, but we never really traveled with the Dudleys. On a couple of occasions we did, but this was one of the rare times. So we're driving and we get down and we're almost in Albany, New York. I think we're I think that's the path we're going. And uh, I know we get there and there we get pulled over like Devon was speeding pretty heavily because it was like a long drive and he just wanted to get in and get it done with because we'd already been stuck in the airport all day and uh and he got pulled over and the ticket was pretty excessive whatever he got you know like I think the speed limit was 65 he got a ticket for like 89 you know 89 miles an hour or whatever you know he was way way over the 10 limit you know 9 to 10 miles per hour rule or whatever you know we'll write your ticket if it's over that so he was like 20 some over and then we start driving again. He's like, man, this just sucks because I did this and my insurance. And like, I just, I, I can't believe that happened. I hadn't had a ticket in a while. I just want to take care of it. And he's like, not even paying attention. And he like speeds up again. <laughs> and like 15 minutes later, he gets another ticket. And he's going like, he's going like 25 over again. <laughs> I mean, like literally we like got past Albany and he gets another ticket. It was like, there were like 15 minutes difference. And I was like, but bro, I'll drive. Like, I'd be happy to drive. You were say, I just, yeah, okay. I can't drive anymore. So How many four-letter words are, are uttered during that period of oh time? Oh my god, it, it's uncountable. <laughs> it was an infinite amount. Was, uh, was Bully like rib, would, would he rib? Like, yeah, he rib Devon because yeah, I know Devon. I've, I've gotten to know Devon pretty well. Yeah. he's very naive in like a very innocent way. Sure, you know. So, like, did Bully take advantage of that at times? I, I mean, I'm sure he did. I'm sure he said, "Oh, great job driving." <laughs> great job i mean he, he would do that where he, he would know how to like jab him you know whenever he could get a little cheap shot in um yeah no i mean he he would he, and th there were times where he would sometimes say stuff and uh you know he'd say, like put that real serious that scowl on you and then he kind of turned into a smile you know whenever he would like let up on the joke uh let up on the joke and let you know let you in on it uh but no he was he was always uh he, he was always cool i always got along good with him you know what i mean like there's a lot of people that will say man i don't like working with Bubba because he was hard to get along with and he just didn't want to do anything or do this. And it's just because he was very protective of his character and he was very protective of all of the Dudley stuff. And I mean, like you were just saying about the 3d, it paid off for that in the long run. You can understand why he was like that. And in a story that I hadn't fully heard about, and he mentioned it, we talked about it today just a little bit. He had just told me that I saw him whenever we went to Luke Gallo's wedding. And this was in probably, 2013 ish and i was doing ring of honor you know and this is kind of you know i i went through went through my shit my my dark days and then uh got out and kind of stayed in touch with him and whatnot and we saw him at his wedding and hung out i think we ate with him and chilled a little bit and he he told me he went back to big uh john gabbard who was kind of booking at tna then he said hey man like i think we should buzz matt he'd be great to come back with jeff and do that and he kind of put that bug in his ear and then uh, I did get a call back from them when I was doing the Ring of Honor deal. And I'd kind of tried to work it out where I could be a heel in Ring of Honor and then be a baby face in TNA. And that's such a Matt Hardy thing, right? Like, oh, let's do some <laughs> that, that, I, I'm just thinking about this in my mind. That's really what I wanted to try and do there. And I thought, I, I think I could have done it uh, because I was so despised in ROH at that time. But that is such a Matt Hardy thing to try and do something oh, yeah. that, like, you know, Ben's logic that is just totally, totally different because he thinks he can do it. I mean, <laughs> you could have been the ROH and just been like, man, look how much they love me in TNA. <laughs> like, like, they love me there. I don't need any of this gimmick bullshit here. Right, right, right. But, but, but long story short, that was very cool that, you know, like Baba, you know, like mentioned that to him and, and everything ended up working out. And we ended up coming back eventually. And we did like that a series with the uh, Hardys versus Dudleys versus Wolves, which was a lot of fun. Yeah. Dave says he said recently that Taker is the only one to kick out of the 3D from the Dudleys. That sounds right. That sounds Pretty absolutely crazy. right. Yeah. Yep. Pretty crazy. Uh, they, they eventually reunite in WWE. They have, they have one last run there about eight years ago or so. Not a whole lot comes from it, unfortunately. Bully was going to go on a solo run, and Vince nixed it at the last second, and eventually they parted ways. Do you remember hearing anything about that? Yeah, I I do. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think they they had offered them deals to like resign. I think they were going to keep them around, and then 
Baba was going to do a, a singles thing. I think he, he was hoping to do that. And then, like you said, Vince nixed it. And then I want to say once he nixed that, I think they like cut they cut ties with Devon too. I think they let Devon's deal run out, if I'm not mistaken. I think Devon started to move to a producer. I mean, that, that may have been what it was, but he yeah. was still going to wrestle and be paid a little more or whatever. But but uh, l- long story short, I, I remember when they came back and it just – I feel like I, I get them coming back and helping to build young talent and newer things, but I, I think they could have been utilized a lot better than they were. Did that give you reserve about going back to WWE, seeing how the Dudleys were treated? No, I mean, I, I just, I, I, it was, you know, it was disheartening that they, I, I felt like they could have used them better. I feel like Vince could have used them better in some ways. And it, it, it didn't really, it didn't, disheartened me it didn't make me question it or whatever I, I i still felt and this is crazy i mean i've i i still felt like we would return to wwe when it was all said and done and uh and ultimately we did in like the biggest way possible but i i, I just wish it could have been utilized better you know i i wasn't actively thinking about it then i was probably just thinking in my moment and i'm one of those people too john like i don't think too far ahead down the road i try and like stay very present in the moment and like what i'm got going on and try and get that shit done because i feel like if you start worrying about years down the road like you'll drive yourself mad um but i i wish they could have got a better run because they are such a, a legendary and iconic yeah. tag team yeah well bubba still out there still doing work in, in yeah. a few different places and and he's doing a legends deal with WWE. Super happy with it. Uh, enjoys it. They have all these products, and they're they're you know that it, it's good. And he's they're they're both very happy to be doing what they're doing. He's on busted open. He's one of the big yeah. characters. What what do you think about Bully, the pro wrestling commentator? Because there's kind of like a meme that anything Bully says, he's just doing it for heat. Yeah, no, it's, it's I mean he he's a guy who who thrives and loves heat, no doubt. Um, I think he's good. I think he makes a lot of valid points. You know what I mean? I, I think there are a lot of valid points he makes, and sometimes he goes over the top in the way he does it, and that kind of plays into him being a you know, a heel or a character or whatever it may be. But I, I do think there's a lot of solid points he makes, and I think, I think Bubba is one of those people who doesn't have a problem having a hard conversation or a difficult conversation because there's some discussions – that people need to be need to talk about in more detail about like maybe what could make something better or why something failed or why something isn't working or whatever else. And there's some people that are afraid to have those tough conversations because they're afraid they're going to hurt someone's feelings or whatnot. But I think those tough conversations are a, a true sign of maturity. I'm not saying being a dickhead about things, but I think being able to have t- tough conversations are a true sign, a true sign of maturity and like uh being comfortable and in interacting with someone that isn't just, uh, you know, unicorns and rainbows. Certainly. So certainly. So I want to get a couple questions in here before we wrap up. Good one from Rajiv here says the Hardy boys versus edge and Christian was definitely crushing it. But do you think those teams would have been as popular today? If not for the Dudleys coming over? I mean, who, who's to say maybe not. I mean, if, if the Dudleys don't come and if it's a big, what if, you know, the Dudleys never come. Who knows where the Hardys and Edge and Christian end up if we don't have that that third team as our dancing partners in all of the iconic TLC matches. Well, and the TLC concept doesn't exist because the tables don't come into the equation. Sure. And I think the tables are the most over ring gimmick of, of any of them. I think you know people chant, we want tables at, in every match. Right. So you add that and take that away, then it's a whole different conversation we're having. And one more from Dave here. I just want to say, uh, do you think the Dudley boys are one of the teams that could work in any era? Yes, I do. Uh, I think, uh, I think they could work in any era. I, I, th- I think they were very smart. And once again, once they turned on their, you know, entertainment aspects, I, uh, I, I love them all the more. Cause I thought that was so great and that they did stuff that they'd established where they don't have to kill themselves with chair shots and bumps and they could do these things that would entertain the people. And they, they were legitimately over, you know, with the tables, get the tables, you know, what's up. And yeah, what that. do you like they more? Do you like what's up or do you like get the tables more? Get the tables. I think. Okay. Yeah. What was up is very much 
reflective of the time period that it originated in. Very, very much so. Very <laughs> much so. And also what's funny about what's up is that Devon had to jump off the top rope and take a, a flat bump every single time. <laughs> you know, what a, what a rib that was. Yeah, Devon Dudley. If you've been to any of our live shows, you know Devon Dudley hates heights. So He's not a fan. Go, him having to go to the top was certainly a good little rib. Anything else you want to say about Bubba here as we wrap up? No, man. Uh, I, I've always had a good relationship with Bubba. I always got along. Uh, always got along good with him, and I love it whenever we do interact. And regardless if it's two weeks since we've talked, or it's two years, or a decade, whatever it is, is the conversation always starts. Like, you go, "What's up, Hod?" And I go, "What's up, Dud?" You know, and that's like that's just that that's our thing. And even when I landed uh, on Sunday, and I happened to scroll through as I was waiting on my baggage, and I just saw his birthday. I was like, "Oh," I said, "I said, I said, happy birthday, Dud." You know, and just uh, about an hour later, after I get home, whatever, he's like, "Oh," he said, "Thanks so much, Hard." And he put a little candle or whatever, which is so funny. He's Once a big again, hard rocker like me too, man. So I'm all about that. Yeah, and and exactly, he definitely is. Oh yeah, he loves his he loves his music. Uh, I was just gonna say, if you don't remember John, you probably do. But like, where all this terminology came from was cool ass Ron Simmons, right? Because there was a time when Ron, whenever he would just speak with someone, he would just like drop, just like put the first syllable in. You know, he'd go like, he would call Ed. You go, what's up, Ed? And it, <laughs> he he would see Chris. He said, what's up, Chris? <laughs> and then he he would see the Dudleys. He go, "What's up, Duds? What's up, Hods?" And I'll never forget. I died. Godfather walked in. He said, "What's up, God?" <laughs> he just did that. And what's so funny about it is that Maxwell and Wolfie are doing that now, and they don't even know about that. They don't like, know I'm the doing, story. They, they, no, I mean they've just been doing like these one syllable things. Like they they have the the Minecraft room and the space room, and I just go, "Oh, where, where's that?" He says, "Mine." And I go, "Where's the space?" What the fuck? What are you doing? What's with this abbreviated dog? And you're just in that first syllable. That's coming like from your wife who abbreviates everything. So <laughs> that's possibly so. That's I, I get a text from your wife and I have to like use a dictionary to try to decipher what she's saying sometimes. Oh my god, <laughs> yes. I think there was a mad fact about how Matt's not a fan of abbreviated modern texting. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly was. It was a little coded. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, good stuff, man. Happy birthday, Bubba Ray Dudley, Bully Ray, Mark LaMonica, whatever you want to call him. Uh, I've had a chance to interact with him quite a few times. I'm, I'm, he's been great to me, and I, I love the interactions that you guys had throughout the years. A transformative figure for my wrestling fandom, the Dudley boys. Right. No questions asked. Even though I would say very honestly, I think the Dudleys were probably number three on my list of the teams, like if I was ranking them. Uh, I still absolutely adored them. They were so fantastic. And, you know, say what you want about them as heels, man. But when those Dudleys were baby faces, my God, were they over. It was yeah. just unlike anything else. Uh, the, the, the was up, the get the tables. Remember, do you remember when they did the angle with the right to censor when it looked like they were going to join right to censor and then they revealed that they weren't? Like I look back at that yeah. and that, those are some of my fondest memories of the attitude era. And they're a big yeah. part of that. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, it's good. The good stuff. I mean, once again, it's just, it's so funny how like, you know, a lot of your fondest memories are things that aren't necessarily even match related. You know what I mean? Just those moments yeah. that were created. I mean, and oh, that's, I mean that's, look, wrestling mat is built around moments, no matter how many okay. great no, matches no you have. No, that's just what I'm saying. I mean, just once again, just so many people carry those great moments with them. You know what I mean? And they, they really touch people in, in such a deep way. Yeah. Well, and a great match has great moments. Yes. You know, th those two things should marry together. Right. So if you give those great moments, like you guys going through the tables of doom in TLC2, that people remember, that's the magic. So... I guess what I'm trying to say is thanks for all the memories, pal. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're welcome. I'm still creating them every single day. <laughs> you know, Adam is the only one of the six of you I haven't met. Because I've met. You, you haven't met him at all? I haven't met Adam at all. I've met Mark. I've met Dave. I've, I've done a lot with Devon. Yeah. Obviously, you two. Yeah. Uh, CLP. I yep. We had him on the podcast, but then uh, I drove you guys around after the first Grand Slam or before the first Grand Slam. Yeah. And then Adam's the only one I haven't met. So I gotta, I gotta check that one off. We'll see uh, how I can make that happen. Well, there you go. 
find our way. Good stuff, man. I, I really appreciate these great stories and your great perspective on a tag team legend and Bubba Ray Dudley. And I want to remind everyone, if you're listening to the extreme life of Matt Hardy, you head on over to advertise with to promote your business to the extreme, get it out in front of thousands of listeners every single week, advertise with hardy.com. Uh, a special thank you to all the people here watching on wrestling. According to alba.com. If yep. you enjoy pro wrestling content, if you enjoy listening to me talk about pro wrestling on this podcast, uh, you head on over to WrestlingCoinAlba.com and you get some really cool pro wrestling content. A great community of smart wrestling fans, intelligent wrestling fans, wonderful wrestling fans, one may even say. That's WrestlingCoinAlba.com. And I'm going to get one more question in from one of those subscribers. Rajiv saying, would Broken Matt call Bully Ray the Ray that is a bully? How would he refer to him? That's pretty good. Um, let me see. I, I I would probably just be be very blunt with it. I would call him Ray the Bully. Ray, Ray the bully. bully. Ray the Bully. What about Bubba? As far as Bubba Ray Dudley. Hmm. I would probably switch that up and I would include an, a Dudley in it in some way too. Yeah. Ouch. The Dudley, the Dudley known as Ray Bubba. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll work on that one. Yeah, yeah, that, that one needs some work. We'll work on that one. Nothing we'll work out. on it. Well, Matt, this has been great. The words have been spoken here on the Extreme Life of Matt Hardy. We will see you next time. Delete! Save with Conrad.com. I'm Nick Castillo from Waterville, Ohio. I've listened to several of his podcasts for a few years and have always heard the ads for Save with Conrad. And my wife and I were looking to refinance and we had looked into a couple different options. And then I had remembered one of the ads and contacted you guys. And here we are. We had some debt that we accumulated and we wanted to uh, pay it down, get everything in a, under a much better more manageable APR. So smooth. I've never had anything finance go that easy. We got a chance to work with Francis and Larry. They made everything comfortable. They were very personable. They were on top of everything. They made sure we were on top of everything. They were with us every step of the way, kind of guiding us. So I, like I said, I've never had an experience that went that smooth. Right off the bat, we saved at least 250 a month. Within a couple of months, we'll probably be at the 400 to 500 mark a month. I'm Nick Castillo from Waterville, Ohio, and I've saved over $400 a month with SaveWithConrad.com. NMLS number 32416, Equal Housing Lender, SaveWithConrad.com.